Why don't you tell us about the European study, which came to a different conclusion? Yeah, the um, ERSPC study started, once again, over 15 years ago, and involved a uh, much larger group of patients, 182,000 uh, patients. Um, much more heterogeneous study. It was uh, conducted at seven different um, countries. They uh, defined a core population of men of about 162,000 men who were between the ages of 55 and 69, and, and this is the group that they reported on. The men were randomized to either screening with PSA um, on average every four years and a digital rectal exam twice over that period of time. In contrast to the uh, PLCO study, the threshold for the most part of doing a biopsy was three, which was less than the PL PLCO study, which standardly had four as the cutoff, although there was variability from country to country in terms of the criteria for doing the biopsy. The median follow-up in this study was nine years, slightly less than the PLCO study. There were about twice as many cases of prostate cancer diagnosed in the experimental arm, the screened arm, than in the non-screened arm, speaking to the, although not documented, less contamination in the ERSPC study than in the PLCO study. Um, in absolute numbers, there was 326 patients who died of prostate cancer in the non-screened arm as compared to 214 patients who died of prostate cancer in the uh, screened arm, which calculated out to be a 20% reduction in mortality with a median follow-up of nine years. Uh, Mary, this study is probably going to be quoted by some of our colleagues as proof that PSA testing should be used routinely. What's your take on that? I think that there are limitations that deserve serious consideration. Firstly, the European study, as Phil said, um, was it actually pulled together trials from different countries, but these different countries used different protocols. It wasn't a uniform design, study design. Secondly, this, is, this study is an interim analysis, and it's the third interim analysis. And so the result of the 20% mortality reduction is only marginally statistically significant at 0.04. Um, raising the question, which is curious, Tom, why stop now? And, and thirdly, the numbers needed to screen, numbers needed to treat are high. The investigators themselves point out that to prevent one prostate cancer death, 1,400 men need to be screened, but more problematic than that, about 48 men would need to be treated. So I think the European investigators um, have some additional studies coming out, analyses on quality of life implications, on cost effectiveness, and those papers will help round out this point. Um, and those are eagerly awaited. But I think uh, at this juncture right now, it, uh, it, it does behoove us, I think, to maintain a healthy skepticism um, about a screening program uh, such as this, because any uh, effective screening program we know requires more than just effectiveness. We have to find out more about quality of life or cost effectiveness. Mm -hmm. So Mary, as you look at these studies and, and other data, do you see evidence that our fears that we might harm patients with PSA testing might be realized? I think that there is convincing evidence of harm, to answer your question, Tom. Uh, the two studies together show um, marginal to no benefit uh, across several years of follow-up at the cost to so many men of overdiagnosis and overtreatment. So that deceptively simple PSA test inevitably leads to a cascade of biopsies, which lead to prostate cancer diagnoses, leading to aggressive treatments for those prostate cancers, leading to men having uh, substantial side effects from those treatments, urinary incontinence, sexual dysfunction, and, and the problem being that for many of these men, they suffer those downstream troubles for a cancer that was never ever destined to cause them harm in their lifetime. Um, so I think that that is a part of the problem. Once we can tell that uh, the indolent cancer that doesn't need to be treated from the aggressive cancer that does, I think the PSA screening controversy will diminish. Um, and in the meantime, I think the onus is on us to uh, maintain that healthy skepticism um, about a, a screening program that's built on inconclusive data on whether or not we are helping more men than we're hurting. I just want to agree with Mary in, in the sense that there's a lot of uncertainty about the downs, downside effects. 
including getting a PSA and having the PSA anxiety, as we call it, associated with an elevated PSA, but not having prostate cancer, the morbidity of the biopsy itself, the overtreatment. I would like to begin to dissociate the whole process of PSA screening from treatment, because I do believe that um, many people who get diagnosed with prostate cancer do not need to be treated, and that's where much of the morbidity exists. I'd like to ask if you to, each of you to summarize what you're going to be saying to the patients and friends and neighbors uh, that you talk to about this topic in the weeks ahead. Mary? Sure. So, uh, Tom, I think I would advise, looking at these papers, caution to patients, uh, caution to physicians uh, and to neighbors and friends. Um, I think that, from my perspective, primary care physicians need to, with our patients, fully acknowledge the ongoing prostate cancer screening controversy. We need to encourage our patients to uh, become informed, fully informed, to consider their preferences and values about their decision, this PSA test. And, and we physicians can help them to know that there's trade-offs, that there are potential benefits and that there are potential harms. And so for men in my own practice, for some men, the PSA decision is the right one we check that box on the lab slip, and that's the right decision for them. For many of my men, once they're fully informed, they decide to forego the PSA test. And for those men, that is the right decision. So I think right now, we're left with a shared decision-making process that is crucial and that works well to help us achieve quality decisions and outcomes for men considering PSA screening in 2009. Phil? I think I'm not going to be saying a lot differently than I, uh, what I was saying a week ago. Um, what I, I learned, I, I confirmed from these studies, is that the mortality from prostate cancer in a screen population is, in the first 10 years is, is, is quite modest. And as a result of that, I, I more firmly feel that if somebody has a life expectancy of under 10 years, one could conceivably forego screening. In my opinion, I do think that there is going to turn out to be a reduction in mortality associated with PSA-based screening, but what I also firmly believe is that not everybody diagnosed with prostate cancer needs to be pigeonholed into a treatment um, paradigm, and we need to individualize because clearly there are many patients who are diagnosed with prostate cancer that do not need to be treated, can be observed safely, and will not die of their cancer. I want to thank both of you, Mary McNaughton Collins and Phil Kantoff, and uh, thank our viewers for joining us.